Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to your fave film critic, the podcast, uh, hosted, produced, starring, recorded by yours truly, Dom Griffin, your favorite film critic. Uh, this is episode nine of season two of the podcast, and uh, I feel like I always start episodes either saying we have a lot to talk about or like, we don't have a lot to talk about, and yet every episode is like roughly the same length. So like, uh, you know, we're, we're going to talk about stuff. It'll, it'll be about the right amount of stuff I would hope. Uh, but, um, this episode is going to be a little bit different in the sense that, uh, I, I didn't watch a lot of stuff, but I read, I read a ton of comic books and I think I've only ever on the pod talked about comics like once back in like season one, maybe once or twice. Um, So like a big chunk of the show is just going to be talking about comics. So like, if that's not your kind of thing, that's okay. I understand. There'll be more movies in the near future, but uh, we will talk about some movie stuff. Just not like a, it's going to be a lot of, a lot of, a lot of superhero stuff. Like a lot of, not all superhero stuff, but a lot of, a lot of comic book stuff. Uh, I feel like all good superhero stories are comic book stories, but obviously not all good comic book stories are superhero stories. So uh, yeah, it should be, it should be fun. Uh, I just cracked open a, a tall boy of liquid death. Uh, this one is one of the flavored sparkling joints. It's a cherry obituary. Um, I've been, I've just been fucking pounding these this week. Not, not ex- explicitly the cherry obituary flavor, but, um, you know, uh, I'm coming up on, on eight years of sobriety in a few weeks here. And everybody knows that knows me knows I love drinking water. Like I just love water in general. And like I cut out, I used to be a really, really big monster head and I kind of quit energy drinks and coffee and stuff like cold Turkey back in like August. I haven't had uh, a monster, a Red Bull, a Celsius, a a ghost, a, a rain, a prime, none of the, none of the good shit. Um, I, I just drink water and like sometimes I drink vitamin water. And I guess sometimes I'll have like once every blue moon, I'll have like a McDonald's sweet tea and cause I want to feel my heart beating out of its chest. Uh, but no, I'm a, I'm a water guy and I hate sparkling water in general. And I also, I'm not a big fan of, um, I'm not a big fan of like flavored water in general. I think it's like stupid. Almost every, every flavored water that people like, like Pamplemousse, LaCroix, whatever, you know, like they, they always taste like water that someone sprayed with like an aerosol can of a flavor. And I hate it. I hate it. I'm fine with just regular ass water is good for me. It's fine. But I like drinking liquid death in can form, uh, because the entire iconography of this brand is designed for washed up, like sober men. I feel like it's just like, do you miss crushing PBR every, every night when you get home from work? just do you want the satisfying crunch of crushing a can in your hands when you're done like do you just miss all the the sort of the 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 outside stuff of drinking without the bad stuff well now you can drink water but there's a giant fucking skull on the can and it's very it's you know it's like edgy and stuff i remember liquid death first became a thing i thought it was kind of stupid uh and like it, 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 it tastes good like i mean it's water like it's 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 cold it's clear i guess whatever However, uh, I just thought it was kind of like, I don't know. I think I was so, I was so, uh, what's the word? I I was so aware that I was being pandered to that it insulted me. Like it kind of grossed me out. Like I was like, this is so much for me that I feel sick. (laughs) I need there to be a little bit of artifice. I want there to be a little bit of finesse to me being conned, you know, I don't mind being a sucker, but I don't really want to be aware of it. But, um, for whatever reason, I've just been trying all the different like flavors of the like flavored sparkling ones. Uh, and some of them suck. Some of them are like terrible. I'm like, how, how, how do you even put this out to people? Don't you feel ashamed? But there's a couple that are like this cherry obituary one's pretty okay. And there's like a, like a, like a melon one. That's all right. But the best one is uh, the armless Palmer. It's like an Arnold Palmer. So, okay. Here's the thing that I, I do with the movies sometimes, right? I do occasionally still drink soda. Like if I go to a movie and I'll get a soda at the freestyle Coke machine, but I'll like fill it maybe like halfway or like like three quarters of the way. And then I'll just top it off with water. It's like a drink like purposely 
my soda starts off tasting like ice melted into it. It's just a thing I do. I don't know. And, uh, this is great because it just comes that way like in the can it's like oh i want an arnold palmer but i don't want too much sugar um yeah i'll take a watered down arnold palmer sure i think they're i think they got sued by uh his estate or something so now they're rebranding it as dead billionaire i believe which is funny so but i've i've just been enjoying them and like i literally completely forgot that that's why i enjoyed them the whole like this uh mimics you know like beer drinking in a way it's like the this is like the I don't know, methadone of of alcohol or <laughs> so i don't this that's a bad a bad metaphor analogy whatever simile whatever uh but like i guess i forgot and then on like my fifth one this week or something when i was done i crushed it in my hand and i was like oh that's what that is i completely forgot that i was i i don't so i don't know if like they got better at their marketing or if i became an easier mark but in, either way it's um I really, I really got to get a liquid death, uh, sponsorship. That's one of my new goals. I got to get, don't you guys want to hear me start the pod with me saying murder your thirst and I'll maybe do it in like a, I'll plug some reverb on it or something. So it sounds like, like I'm using the voice, like the Benny Gesserit. But yeah, anyway, uh, we'll start off with, uh, the news. I only have two news items to talk about. Then we'll talk about some of what I watched. Then we've got a couple of questions at the end. You guys know the drill by now. New stuff. Uh, I just saw this maybe like a, like last night. I think I got clued into this, but uh, there's this horror movie that's out in limited release right now called Late Night with the Devil, and it's like some new filmmakers. I'm not very familiar with them, and uh, it stars David Dasmalkian. The he's in like a bunch of stuff. He was he had a small role in Dune. Um, he was the polka dot man in the Suicide. He's you, you've seen you've seen this fucking guy. You know who I'm talking about. He's one of like the guys. He's one of those guys. Uh, I've been seeing ads for it. I thought it looked cool. For whatever reason, the first few times I saw the ad, I thought this was the kind of movie that like John Hawks would be in. But good for David getting this bit, this uh, this part. Anyway, I thought it looked interesting. I was I was curious to check it out. But then, and I saw a lot of like raves of people being like, "Yeah, it's really good. It looks exciting or whatever." And then out of nowhere, they had they were riding all this buzz into opening weekend. That's just fucking gone now because it came out that they used AI generated art, uh, in the movie. And it's not even like a lot of it, but I guess there's a couple of like interstitial interstitial bits in the, from like from the fictional show within the movie. And they used an AI art generator to make them. And this is one of those, this is one of those online debates where like, it feels like every, corner of the discourse is just wrong and like and, and i don't think i don't mean that everyone is wrong what i mean is just that like the way they are going about it is so irritating that it's like indistinguishable from being incorrect so like i don't know if you've ever seen like doordash discourse on, on on twitter or anywhere it happens like once every couple of months where people talk about how doordash as a service is inherently exploitative and then if you use it on a regular basis like you are tacitly uh, part and parcel of that exploitation. And then people kind of fight back that are, you know, it's like, yeah, but like, you know, like, you know, people say that criticism of DoorDash is like ableist because there are people that actually do have to rely on services like that. And I don't know how to describe it other than to say that like every side of it, they're all, they all sound like assholes (laughs) because like the people who are kind of rightly pointing out uh, the inherent exploitation of, of the gig economy and stuff, it's like, that's true, but they, it, it doesn't feel like they give a shit about that. Like, it just feels like this is a thing they get to kind of lord over people on, on the internet. And the people that defend it are like defending it. Like, this is my God given fucking right to force a person to bring me Taco Bell, you know? And it's like, I feel like the correct response would just be to be like, uh, yeah, no, I know this is morally bereft, but I'm also lazy and I'm just doing this. Do you know? Like, I, I just feel like that would be simpler. Just acknowledge that, you know, that there's a bad side to this. And that you just personally don't care enough about it to not do it and then just move on. But no, it has to be this, like everyone is just going to fucking war. Cause that's how the, the platform works. Uh, I felt like the discourse about this was similar to that. Maybe it's cause I saw them both unfolding on my timeline at the same time. Also, I spent very little of my time this week on the internet, uh, compared to how I normally do because I spent almost the entire week when I was on at work, obviously reading comics. Uh, and I'll get into that later, but like 
I pulled my head out of comics world to poke on the internet and I saw people calling each other borderline slurs over either defending or vilifying DoorDash. And then alongside that, I saw people arguing about late night with the devil and the AI thing. And obviously a lot of people, and I agree with this, is that if you are, um, skeptical of, and, and, you know, staunchly against the use of AI art in like professional spaces that could create, that could essentially be taking work away from artists, then them using AI art in this movie is like objectively wrong, right? Like, to, like to, to, to you uh, in this, in this case. And I've seen a lot of people who are defending it being like, yeah, but the movie's really good. So, <laughs> and it's like, okay, um, just cause the movie is good or you like it does not mean that it is, uh, shielded from criticism. This is like valid criticism. Like obviously the conversation about AI, AI stuff has been, uh, a hot debate for a while now because we keep seeing all these new breakthroughs and like it just, it, it, it keeps being used in more and more places. We just saw a ton of media layoffs at all these different internet publications and stuff. And many of them are using, you know, chat GPT to write articles and shit like that. So like, it's not a thing where it's like, it's a theoretical situation that this is going to take jobs from people. It's like, this is really happening. It's unfolding. We're seeing it happen. And in this specific case, it did take a job from someone because th this would be someone's job on this movie to generate the art for those interstitials. Right? So like, there's not really a way around this. Like they did this. And like, I, I guess the filmmakers released a statement saying like, we did use AI for these three pieces, like these three images, but we also like doctored them and messed with them and, and enhanced them further, which to me made it seem worse. Cause here's, here's my argument. I mean, I still want to see this movie. I'm probably still going to check it out. Like I'm, I'm very curious about it, you know? Uh, but the argument <laughs> is like, if you're, Okay, like I understand that you're kind of saying, look, it's just these three little pieces and we 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 tinkered with it afterwards. I know it's like you guys think that means it's less of an infraction, but to me it feels like more of an infraction because I'm pretty sure I know what what type of art they I haven't seen the movie, but I, I kind of have a feeling I understand what type of stuff it was, and I feel like you could make that on your fucking phone. Like you could probably do this in like fucking pix art or something. You know what I mean? Like, you don't, you probably wouldn't even have to fire a Photoshop. Like you could, you could do this in procreate. There's all, these, there's all these tools where you yourself could do it. And like, you could do it probably on like a lunch break. Like it's not even, uh, like some hardcore, uh, heavy, you know, like layer graphics work that like someone would have to put a lot of time into. It actually sounds like a pretty simple, easy thing. So the idea of like, well, we use AI for that. I'm like, you used, it's not like we used AI because we could not afford, this is a low budget movie and there's like some things we needed to do that we couldn't afford the CG for or something. Not that that would make it less bad, but it would be like, I can sort of see an argument for what, why they chose to do this. Like maybe what, what, how they're justifying it to themselves, you know, but, oh shit. But, um, you know, I, I can't agree with your defense being, we only used a little, just a little bit, and 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 we we messed with it further. It's like you could have just done it then. I would almost have respected more. Like, yeah, there's a bunch of shit that we just chose to use AI for. Fuck you. This is why we decided to do it. We don't care. I would respect that more than like, mm, no, come on, we're just small beans, and we just, it's a little budget movie, and we just needed to, like, bro, just fucking own it or don't. Do you know what I mean? Like, own it or don't. I don't think there's a lot of like. I mean, they're getting fucking cooked about this right now. And I mean, Hey, they chose to do this and this is how people feel about using those tools in this particular way. Uh, I, I personally am not as staunchly anti AI as I probably ought to be. Uh, like I'm aware of that. It's like, I, I've looked at it kind of like, I remember when like AI stuff first started becoming really prevalent and it was like those apps where you pay like a dollar, like two, like two or $3 or something. And then it takes like a selfie or pictures of you. And then it makes a bunch of AI generated profile pictures. That was like, I feel like the first wave of this really becoming like a big trend. And I remember people were just like this, especially I saw artists, but this is so fucked up. This is like, you're really, you know, like, you know, if you want this so bad, though, why wouldn't you just like hire an artist friend of yours, like to do a commission? Like this is really taking work away from them. And I kind of looked at it as being like, look, anyone who, 
chose to spend three dollars on an app to make a bunch of goofy pictures they're going to look at once post on the internet and never think of it again was not a prospective commission customer do you know what i mean like it's not like they were considering generating a hundred images of themselves from a hundred different artists in a hundred different styles and if they did that would have cost you know considerably more than three dollars this is not like a in those cases when someone's just kind of like dicking around with it I don't really get all that worked up because I'm like, I don't, I mean, like it, to me, this is not something that was like a commercial product or like a project or something. You're just like dicking around. Do you know what I mean? Like I love making memes using AI art generators. I think it's funny. Uh, I'm not trying to fucking profit off of them or something. Do you know what I mean? This isn't work I would outsource to a friend. I wouldn't be like, Hey bro, I got this idea about Sonic and he's wearing a strap on and then, or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, and then can you draw this for me? Like, no, I'm just fucking dicking around because I'm bored. And like, to me, most of the applications for artificial intelligence stuff to me is just like, I like it when people make Cartman sing uh, Celine Dion songs. You know what I mean? Like, I like hearing the Isley Brothers, but it's SpongeBob. I like it, I think it's funny. It's, I, I know it's stupid. I know a lot of people think it's inc- extremely stupid. But for me, it's very entertaining. And in those instances, I'm just like, yeah, if, if we just use AI art to make like, fake arguments between Biden and Trump, but they're debating like the best characters from Yu-Gi-Oh or something. That's funny to me. That's fine. Whatever. Uh, Obviously there are other implications of using it in other applications that are like bad and and scary and stuff. And I get that, but I've just not been a big alarmist about it personally. But this was a case where I felt like, you know, the people who are mad about this have every right to be it. This is literally, this is exactly what people are talking about is, We don't want to see AI encroaching into the industry in this specific way. This is like a specific example of the specific thing people were worried about during the strikes. And then the defense of that being like, well, come on, it's not a big deal. It's only a little bit. And it's just like, dude, grow the fuck up. You know, it's not just a little bit, you know? So I don't know. I don't know how you guys feel about the AI stuff or what your thoughts are. But I just remember thinking like people were going to fucking war over this. And I was like, I don't even think I can't imagine a person being this mad about this with this movie. And then I couldn't imagine another person being feeling compelled to defend it to this degree either. Both sides to me seemed kind of like, hey, this is a lot for this, you know? But um, I, I will obviously say, though, I, I side with the people who are like, this is bullshit. Don't do this type of stuff, you know? And you, I mean, hey, if this movie ends up like doing worse than it was projected to, then you can clearly look at this and say, hey, the marketplace is even supporting that this is dumb. Don't do this stuff. People aren't, aren't going to fuck with it. Um, but we'll see. I mean, it's <laughs> I don't think this movie was going to make a lot of money to begin with, but yeah, uh, the only other bit of news I want to talk about was, um, I guess it ended up being temporarily debunked or whatever, but the sun was reporting that the Eon, the broccolis, whatever the fuck they, they had found the new James Bond. And there's been rumors for a while that like Aaron Taylor Johnson was one of the front runners. And the rumor was that he was like signing imminently or whatever. And then I believe variety debunked it and was like, that's not true. He's not been offered the part. And I, it's what's funny to me, I guess, is like, I know that the way this works is that they were going to announce an actor before they announce anything else. So they're going to have to have a whole rollout of the new bond and photo shoots and stuff. But I don't actually give a shit who they cast as the new James Bond. I want to know who's directing it and who's writing it. Like, I want to know what the like vision is for the new bond. Uh, and I mean, one, I think they should just give it to Martin Campbell again. He's already done two, very successful Bond reboots, and they're two of the best Bond movies ever. So maybe let him get one more try. I mean, fuck, that's fine. He's not doing shit else. Um, I know a lot of people thought we were gonna get the Nolan Bond thing, but I don't see that happening uh, for a lot of reasons because, like, I don't even know what a Nolan Bond would look like. Like that, that would like the the Craig movies borrowed from him so heavily that like, what would that even look like? What would be the point? That's been done already. Uh. <laughs> my my friend justin from uh trouble beam streams the black print the a show lots of great podcasts uh about a year or two ago pitched me this like horrible fucking idea of what they're gonna do with bond next it was essentially just like the mcuification of james bond and it haunts me like i keep i, I sometimes have nightmares about the horrible bond trailer he riffed in the group chat one day and like every da- time there's bond news i have to go check to make sure none of those pieces are in play i have to make sure none of no parts of his his ideas seem to be being used because i would just lose my mind because it was so awful but here's my thing about aaron taylor johnson i think he's pretty talented good looking cat he's got a he's got a, a good presence and stuff 
I don't think he would be a bad bond. I'm sure he'd probably be solid or, or whatever. My only thing was like, you just had Craig for what, 15 years or something like that. Like it was, he was bond for a while. And I, I just the way the kind of intensity that, uh, Johnson brings to the, his like better roles is not dissimilar to the way Craig approached the part. And I just feel like it would be pointless to bring in a new bond who just continues in that direction. Uh, when there's a chance to do something very new, you know, I think that what, uh, you know, what Pierce Brosnan did was very different than what Dalton did. What Dalton did was very different than what Moore had been doing for a long time. Like, it just seems dumb to me to like Craig retires and then you just bring in someone else to be Craig adjacent. Do you know? So I don't, I don't know how I feel about that side of casting him. If that does, cause I mean, it got debunked, but I mean, I don't know if that just means like he hasn't signed yet and he still eventually will. Or there's someone else who's closer or how close they even are to any of this. Cause like, I don't know what the fucking timetable for this whole shit is. You know what I mean? I don't know where they're going to go with it, but like, uh, I, I like bond. I love the, I love the bond movies, even the bad ones, you know, and I, I'm excited to see what, what happens next. But to me, that excitement does not lie with who is bond. It's going to be like, what is bond going to be? What are they going to, what's the, what's the, you know, cause the bond movies tend to be a reflection of like the modern times. You know what I mean? And, uh, currently I don't know what that looks like. Like what would a new bond movie be? Would it be like a John wiki bond? Would it be like a bond that's like, is David Leitch going to do it? And it's going to be like a bullet train bond. You know what I mean? Like, is it like what, what current thing are they going to, uh, draw their inspiration from? We've already seen like Nolan's influence in the bond films and the Bourne films influence in the bond films and stuff like that. So I don't know. I don't know where, where it's going to go. Um, but I'm curious. I don't know. I thought I just thought it was interesting that they, that even leaked and then ended up being like, not, not quite true or, or what have you. Uh, again, good looking guy, uh, pretty talented. He's, I think he's, I think he's pretty underrated. I feel like we've never really seen him get the opportunity to show like his full potential, you know, and everything he's in, he usually kind of gives it his all to like, He's very good in bullet train, even though I think bullet train is like kind of a kind of, kind of shitty. And, uh, he's, I love his smallish part in Tenet. Like I was like, Hey, if his, if his entire approach to bond is he's just his character from Tenet <laughs> and he's just like talking about temporal pincer maneuvers and stuff, then like, fuck it, I'm on board. But I don't know. Who do you guys think should do bond next? Who do you think? What are your fan castings for bond? I'm always curious to know what people want to do with this character. Uh, I just don't I, I, like, I don't, some of the people like, you know, Dev Patel or like, that could be cool. Or like Henry Golding, like, you know, let's, Let's get away from me and white guys. And I'm all for that. But it's like, again, to me, it's like, it doesn't matter who you pick. If ultimately it's going to be some bullshit. Like if Purvis and Wade get brought back to right there, like 11th Bond movie in a row, what are we doing here? You know, let's, let's try something new. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the news. Not a, not a ton of stuff in the news. Um, we'll talk about what I watched, which was not a lot of stuff. So Friday night, uh, before, Friday night before, um, before nothing. This was just Friday night. I was just home <laughs> Friday night. Uh, I, or I guess it was Friday afternoon. I watched the founder uh, again, which I had not watched in a little while. Uh, the founder is a movie where Michael Keaton plays Ray Kroc, the sort of godfather of the modern McDonald's, not the inventor of McDonald's, but the innovator of McDonald's, I guess. And it's directed by Johnny Hancock, I think. And it's written by Robert Siegel, who wrote The Wrestler and Big Fan. And it is one of my favorite more recent movies. Like, it's a weird movie to say it's your favorite because it's not, like, great or spectacular necessarily. But it's essentially just There Will Be Blood, <laughs> but with burgers. It's just, it's literally Ray Kroc is, like, Daniel Plainview of fast food. And I love it. It's, like, it, it's definitely part of the margin call big short sort of industrial complex of youtube and tiktok clips you know what i mean that like sigma business guys will take take clips from this movie and post it with like heavy edits and kind of being like you know a movie that is supposed to be a cautionary tale about the dangers of capitalism someone will share it and be like this is how you have to do be in business <laughs> you know like it's like gordon gecko was right uh but i'd seen there's a clip from the movie that i saw on as like a youtube short or Michael Keaton's character, Rock, Rick Rock, well, the, he's a real person, Rick Rock, has started to franchise out the McDonald's concept to some like rich friends of his. And the guys all like fuck up the basic concept and aren't 
they're not keeping the quality control of what made the original McDonald's special. Uh, and he like rolls up on this guy at the golf course and is like showing him that the burger's all fucked up and this is not what a McDonald's burger should be. And why are you guys selling fried chicken? What the fuck? <laughs> and um, I was like, oh yeah, I like this movie. Let me go rewatch it. So I rewatched it and it holds up really well. If you've never seen it, I strongly suggest seeing the founder. Uh, I find the story, the Ray Kroc story, very fascinating. And I, I think it's, I think it's a really underrated movie. And the fact that Michael Keaton's performance is very good. All the little performances in the movie are pretty good. Uh, it has, it has a pretty, really good pace. The structure of it's pretty strong. Uh, very little of it, uh, sags, but it is kind of heartbreaking. You know what I mean? Like you meet these two, the, the McDonald's brothers are played by Nick Offerman and, uh, the Zodiac killer. I can't remember the actor's name, but he's like the guy who says I'm not the Zodiac and Zodiac who might be Zodiac. Uh, he's in a lot of stuff, but I'd always forget his name and I'm not even going to look it up, but they play the McDonald's brothers and they have this beautiful restaurant in San Bernardino, California. And it like completely, you know, it like changes Ray Kroc's like world. He wants to franchise it and they don't want to because they tried franchising it themselves and there was no quality control. They couldn't reproduce what made their restaurant special. Uh, and then he, essentially talks them into it, but then he ends up not being able to profit off of it the right way because of the deal they have. So he ends up fi essentially just stealing it out from under them. And the way he does it is like very, very fucked up and wrong. Uh, and it's something about it just like really speaks to me. I don't know what it is. Like I love movies where the main character is like just a greedy piece of shit. Uh, I, I love movies that just show what greed does to people at like the kind of like treasure Sierra Madre energy or like, uh, more recently even, um, uh, like triple frontier. You know what I mean? Like I love movies where like someone is just like you are watching them just turn into the worst version of themselves for money. Uh, I think it's just always fun. Even like bad versions of that story really do it for me. So yeah, I rewatched the founder pretty, pretty fun stuff. Still pretty, pretty good. It's also just nice that Michael Keaton did that. And like he hasn't otherwise had a lot of really good roles in a while. Like he's got that. Uh, I think he's very good in Spider-Man far from home, but like that doesn't really count. And I think he's very good in the other guys, <laughs> you know, there's a couple little things he does, but I think this movie has a really good synthesis of all the things you could like about Michael Keaton. There's parts where he's menacing. There's parts where he's funny. There's parts where he's tragic. Like he, it really is like a, 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 a an all over very good performance. And I definitely think you guys should check it out if you've never seen it. Uh, then uh, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday I saw Dune Part Two for the third time. Uh, it was my homie Cody's birthday. Happy birthday again to Cody! And uh, he hasn't seen it yet, so me, him, and our friend Alex saw it uh, at the same Dolby house I saw it the first time. And holds up, holds up very strong, very, very strong. But there's something about it I wanted to talk about real quick. I've talked about Dune, I guess, enough lately. But just this, this one thing, two things. I hate how many people had been making the goddamned Austin Butler still sounds like Elvis jokes for the last like month. And especially about it in Dune. Be like, yeah, you just can't turn that Elvis thing off. And I'm like, I know you're just trying to participate in what you think is a funny gag. I know you're just doing this for engagement. But if you watch Dune Part 2 and you genuinely thought that Austin Butler still sounded like Elvis, something is wrong with your ears or the fucking brain they're attached to. Because the thing I love so much about his performance is that he he sounds seamlessly like he is one of the Scars Guards. He sounds like he is related to, to Baron Harkonnen. It's such a like it's such a good take. And um I thought it was very impressive. And the fact that people are still being like, ha oh, ha, he sounds like Elvis, ha oh, ha. And like, if you see interviews with him and stuff, like he doesn't fucking still talk like Elvis. That's like, you're just lying at this point. Someone did like a video thing where it was like, uh, Austin Taylor's like voice transformation over the years. And his voice started changing and sounding more the way it sounds now before he did Elvis. He just got older and his voice got deeper. Like it's not fucking that weird. Now the fact that he always kind of has that like breathy drawl and stuff is like, I guess it's somewhat Elvis adjacent, but like. He has that bike riders movie coming out and he just talks like a biker guy in that. It's kind of how he sounds. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I just need people to stop that shit. It's such a corny bit and it's just not even accurate. I don't want to hear that shit anymore. Uh, Austin Butler is clearly on the way to like genuine movie stardom and we should just stop fucking with him. He seems like a good cat. I like him. 
the second thing is that there have been so many Dune memes for the last, what, month and a half, two months, whatever. Uh, no, month? Is it, I don't know how long it's been. I, time is a, was whatever. But there's been so many. And I've seen so many of them that this time watching the movie, there's a bunch of bits that are funnier than they should be. And I'm realizing that some people who are late to the Dune party but have seen a bunch of the memes first are experiencing a very different version of Dune. Because, like, Stilgar, like, Javier Bardem's character, is very funny. I said that in my original review. But parts of the movie that are, like, not actually still meant to be funny, the parts where it's like, okay, you're kind of supposed to laugh at his fanaticism, and then you're kind of supposed to be, you know, creeped out by it, and also a little bit depressed by it by the end. Now that there's been all these memes, even those parts are funny. You know what I mean? Like, every time he says, Le San you're like, it, there's a bunch of memes you've already seen about about that, you know? And so that kind of stuck out to me on this watch. The thing that stuck out to me more though is that I have seen the the Dune TikTok edit, the like the the, the Paul Atreides is badass edit that has the same twelve shots in it and has the same punctuation on the point when he yells silence at the Reverend Mother, and then like the song by Yeet starts in. I've I've seen so many variations of that exact TikTok with the exact same structure, the same music use, the same shots, but just different like shaky edits and stuff and shaky like uh, effects and, and filters i've seen so many of them that in the movie this time when he de- when you get to the bit where he yells silence i i instinctively heard the beat drop in the song start even though it didn't and part of me was like yo was someone in the projection booth just fucking around uh but no no i just my brain is poisoned by the internet <laughs> uh now i mean it's a great moment too it's like a real, a real crowd pleasing moment but yeah, the memes have just taken over. It's like all I think about now. And I'm like, there's going to be someone who's coming to Dune real late. And this movie is going to be a lot funnier than it needs to be for them. Because they, they will have seen all this stuff already. And uh, that's just, I don't know, it's fascinating to me. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of sleepy. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, no, Dune still holds up really well. I, I do think, I, I've talked to death about this, that the, the whole ending of the movie and people arguing about Paul being a hero versus an anti-hero versus a villain or whatever. And this time I watched it, I think the main reason the ending doesn't fully stick for me is not the fact that they end on, on Chani. It's the fact that the way Timothy delivers the line uh, to the to, to Stilgar and then they're like, you know, what do we do next? And he's like, you know, send them to, you know, deliver them to paradise, whatever the exact line is. He delivers it so well. It sounds so defeated and just all this, you're like, yeah. But Hans Zimmer's score sucks. Like the music for the last like few minutes of that movie is like not good. I don't know how it should sound. I'm not a composer, but I just remember thinking like that's actually what's wrong. It made me think about when Tom Cruise talked about having how Rogue Nation Mission Impossible Five was uh, testing poorly because of the way the move this temp score for the ending of the movie felt like, like the movie kept ending. It was just like bum bum. Like it kept feeling like the end of the movie kept happening and made people think it was too long. And then they got the composer to to write a piece of music that like would a suite that would play throughout the entire ending as like one big thing. And then when they fixed that, then people didn't feel the ending was too long. And I'm not particularly great at talking about uh, scores and stuff like that. Like I love music, but I'm not like uh, I don't have the vocabulary for it necessarily. And most of the time when I watch a movie, my opinion of the score is either I like how this sounds or I hate it. (laughs) I don't have a lot of like nuance for that particular part of the process. But for this, I did feel like this doesn't sound right. I don't know what I wanted it to sound like, but I did feel like this is just not the, this is not the play. And I definitely feel like if there was a different piece of music underlying that moment, I would feel differently. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's, that's what I cut out of this third watch. I still think I need to see at least one more time in theaters. So I think for my fourth viewing, I think I'm going to have to go to Regal and watch it in 4DX. I want to see if they blow dust in my fucking eyes. Uh, So I will report back my findings if I end up doing that. Whenever I end up doing that, I imagine Dune's going to be in theaters for like six six or seven months or something. Uh, But yeah, I, uh, I've, I love this movie, man. And I I love the phenomenon around that. I love everyone getting into it and people talking about it and stuff. It's a, it's a blast. Um, So that's all I watched. I did, okay, I did also, just now, before I started recording, I watched the first two episodes of X-Men 97, and I want to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it after I talk about what I read this week, uh, because I think some of the things I'm going to talk about with the comics I read will go into my feelings about the show a little bit, maybe, 
or not. It might be like a really random mess. I, I read a ton of shit and I, I my notes do not really justify uh, everything that I read. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, we'll see how my mind actually remembers uh, my experiences from the last seven days. Let me tell you guys something. Recording a podcast once a week, like every single week, uh, really puts into perspective like your life <laughs> sometimes. Uh, because there are times where I sit down to record the episode and I'm like, I don't fucking remember what happened this week. I don't remember this week that this week just blew by. And there are other times where like stuff happened and that the stuff that happens to me, the day the episode comes out always feels like it was from wherever ago. Like me watching the founder. I almost didn't talk about that this week cause I forgot that I even did it cause it happened like on episode day. Um, which is weird because I feel like that's actually the oftentimes that is the night I watch the most movies. That Friday I watch a lot of movies on Friday nights. Not not lately, but usually when I do, that's the, that's the night. So yeah. So okay, I comics, 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 comics. I love comic books. I feel like if I had to distill my three biggest loves, uh, it's it's comics, it's pro wrestling, and it's movies. And comics came first, quite frankly. Uh, and when I was a kid, I wanted to make comics. I wanted to be an artist. I'm terrible at it though. I wanted, then I wanted to be a comic book writer. Uh, I'm not that great at that either, I guess. I mean, I guess I'm okay, but I don't know. I, I eventually kind of stopped wanting to pursue it. Maybe someday. I don't know, but I love reading comics that, that has never gone away. The thing that has changed for me is that sometimes I go through periods where I cannot juggle all of my hobbies. So like movies are kind of a constant, especially as a critic, cause I'm always having to at least go review some stuff, but I'll go through long stretches where I don't read any comics. Uh, same with wrestling. I'll go through stretches when I just don't watch wrestling and then I'll get back into it. I, I was kind of consistently reading comics like on a week to week basis for a while. I would say from like the like 2011, 12 till maybe 2021. Like I feel like most of that decade I was actually reading pretty, pretty consistently. I would take breaks for like five or six months and then I would catch up. But I, I, I comics were pretty constant in my life. 2020, I reread, a, I read a lot of time, comics during lockdown. Like I, like a lot. I think, I think like the first or second month of lockdown, I reread like every Batman comic from like Whenever I started reading them as a child to present day, I read tons and tons of comics. I love reading comics, but some probably like early 2021 ish before I went back to work and before like outside fully kind of opened back up in my area. Uh, I just fell off. Like there were a bunch of books I was reading month to, like week to week that I was like, or like month to month or whatever that were my, 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 my weeklies. And then I just fell off. And you know, usually you, what happens is you fall off for like a month or two months or three months. And then you come in and you catch up on the last few issues you missed and you're back to normal. But I just never did that. <laughs> it's been almost three years of just me not reading any comics. And like every now and again, a new series would come out that I'd get curious about. Uh, and I'd check out a thing, an issue here or there. But I didn't really throw myself back into it. Uh, and uh, the last several months, uh, a friend of the show, Bryant, uh, and I have been talking about comics. And he's always like, have you read this yet? Have you read this yet? And I was like, bro, I'm just so far behind, but I will. I'm always like, anything you recommend me, I'll check out. Like he has good taste. He's a, he's a good dude. Uh, and then recently I was like, you know what? I am spending way too much of my time like on Twitter or like on TikTok or just like rotting in bed when I don't have anything I want to work on. And like, I don't read as much as I, as much as I used to. Uh, I really miss reading like i don't want to read books anymore i very rarely read books i don't like buying physical books and i don't like the way kindles feel and i don't it's a whole thing but like i realize you can kind of like you know use like an ipad as like a as like a lar largely as a reading device which is a bit overkill but um i was like you know what i'm just gonna go full back into like digital comics again and i can also start using like the kindle app and like reading again like i'm gonna start forcing myself to read books that chunk of the night where i'm usually looking at dumb shit on tiktok i could be reading things uh and because i'm a giant baby i felt like it would be nicer i really I, initially i was like i really want to reread dune that's where i'm going to start but then i was like i do not fucking have the mental patience right now to go into herbert's prose so i'm gonna start by just reading comic books like a baby and, and doing that and, uh, I, I did a trial for a DC's, uh, comics reader app, DC universe infinite, uh, which I think is like seven ninety nine a month. Uh, and you get nearly unlimited access to most of their digital comics. Uh, but then there's a 
did the DC universe infinite ultra, which is like the super subscription and it's $120 for the whole year. And you have to pay for it by the year you can do it by the month. Uh, and then what that is, is the difference is that when a new issue comes out, it hits infinite in 30 days, which is where with the regular infinite subscription, new issues hit in six months. So like, it'll just be stuff up to six months ago, you know, but like, which, which wasn't a big issue for me at the start because like I haven't anything for three years. So like, I'm just catching up on those for now, but I, I'm, I'm, I guess I've always been slightly more partial to DC, even though I like Marvel and I like a lot of Marvel stuff. I love the X-Men and whatnot. Uh, Marvel's been doing very little to really excite me for a while now. So like the handful of things I was most excited to dive back into were all at DC. So, uh, the first thing I, I really did was, uh, one of the books I was enjoying before I, my hiatus was, uh, the, the main flagship Batman title. Uh, I was really into, uh, James Tynion in the fourth, uh, had taken over Batman around issue like 92 or something maybe. Uh, and I think he ended up sticking around till like one 20 ish. Uh, and I think it's a really underrated run of the title. I think he did a lot of fun stuff. Um, it's, there's a couple of big arcs that he did. Like, um, like the, the Joker war is really good. Uh, he introduces this character ghost maker who's like, a, like, a, you know, they always retcon Batman into having friends that we've never heard of before. <laughs> like when I was a kid and the hush storyline happened, it was like, Oh, this is Tommy Elliot. He was Bruce Wayne's best friend. Like, and we've never met this guy before. At the same time, there's a new villain on in town who dresses the same as this guy. You know, it, it's, it's a, it's a classic trope of like, there's a new Batman person. Oh, he always knew this guy from years ago. Uh, but he does with this guy, Ghostmaker, who's just like a rival vigilante who he trained with as a youth, who's his like nemesis. But there's also a lot of sexual tension between them. Uh, and he shows back up and he ends up becoming kind of part of the Bat family. And he just feels like an anime character or something. Or someone's like self-insert in a fanfic. He's a very, very entertaining character to me. Uh, and the book just had this kind of playfulness that I don't think Batman had had in the main, in the main continuity for a little while. Like there was a period where Scott Snyder was writing Batman and his Batman was so like intense and kind of self-serious. And then he started to make like lighten up, but then it felt like he lightened up too much and everything he was doing was just like really crazy and over the top and fun. But it was a fun that was, I think aggressive and a little bit weird. I think the level of fun that Tynan had is, was just more my speed. I was like, this is really, I like this. I liked the art, I liked a lot of different things in the book that were really cool, and it was fun catching up on that. Uh, and then I knew that Chip Zdarsky, um, artist of Sex Criminals, writer of, I think he's writing Daredevil recently over at Marvel, and some other stuff. Like, you've probably read other stuff Zdarsky's written. He took over Batman, and I don't like everything he's been doing, but I like a lot of the stuff he's been doing. He's been pretty fun. Uh, but doing starting off with that kind of fucked me up, because I... Uh, the Tynan stuff was like all wrapping up his run in the book. So it was all pretty self-contained, but then not very long into Zdarsky's run, there was a crossover in one of those events. And like, these happen all the time. They're unavoidable in superhero comics. But if you're reading them on like, in like an app, like, you know, like on, on your, like a device or whatever, uh, it can be way more jarring because usually you are finished reading an issue and on infinite, it'll just be like, here's the next issue. And if there's like an annual or a giant size one-off special or something, those get slotted in, in the sequence of when they were published. So if there is a side thing you need to read, that will come up first before the next issue, which is helpful. But there was an, uh, a thing that was like the, the crime war or something. It was a like Gotham war. It was like a, an event that was crossing between Batman and Catwoman's solo title. And a crossover with some other books because they published like fucking 19 books that take place in Gotham City. And I was reading one issue that was its own story thing. And then the next issue opened up with part two of the Gotham War. And I was like, part two? What the what the fuck was part one? Because it, it didn't prompt me to read like a one shot or something. And then when I went to go look it up by story arc, which is the thing you can do, it showed me the Gotham War arc. And all of the Catwoman parts of it were were ultra uh, subscription only. So it was like, oh, because I told myself at first, I hate reading events so much. I'll just skip it because you can generally tell what happened in between the issues you're not reading. That's like the secret to these events. Like they are. It's like you have to read all of them. You really fucking don't. I promise you. Uh, I was going to do that anyway, but I did want to at least see part one maybe to figure out what, what, what the impetus was. And then I saw that essentially half of the of the crossover was unavailable to me unless I upgraded for my free trial to spending $120. 
Um, and I was like, well, I'm not doing that. So I just completely skipped, uh, all the, all the Catwoman stuff. And I wasn't a fan of the, the, what I did read of it to begin with. I thought it was just kind of going in a weird direction and it didn't last very long anyway, but it just reminded me like, man, these are the things that comics are doing that make it hard for regular people to want to try. Cause it's just not natural. It's not natural to be reading a story about a character you like. And then two to three times a year, having that story interrupted by a larger story that then is like, just it is it, it, bullshit and just goes away, you know? So, that made me decide, okay, well, I kind of maybe need to take a break from heavily reading stuff that's like main continuity where it's like all tied into everything that's going on because these, 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 uh, these lines are always bogged down by whatever editorial, uh, edicts are going down and stuff. So instead I was like, I'm going to, I got into three main things that I read. Uh, I caught up on a bunch of stuff that Mark Wade has been doing at DC the last few years. And that was probably the most fun I had. I'll get into that in a second. And then uh, I read a bunch of stuff that Tom King has been doing over at DC. Uh, and that was, that was a little more hit or miss, but some of the stuff was good. I'll talk about that. And then the bulk of what I did these last couple of days is I reread like all of Ed Brubaker's, Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips comic Criminal. Uh, and I'll get into that last, I guess. But it was... So Mark Wade, Mark Wade is a comic book writer. I've been a huge fan of since I was like 10 years old, probably, um, kind of a throwback guy, a real encyclopedia about like superhero history. He, you know, more casual readers might know he wrote uh, Superman birthright. He wrote kingdom come. Uh, he's done a lot of stuff. Some of his stuff is like whatever, but a lot of Mark Wade stuff is, is quite good. There's a handful of books he's done that I think are dog shit, but most of them are like genuinely great. He's one of my faves. And the one thing I've liked about him in the last like 10 or 10 or so years is when he's working at, he's, he did a lot of work at Marvel. He's been very good at being able to take a character sort of back to like an essence and doing kind of throwback silver age adjacent superhero stories, but still making them feel modern and not making them feel hokey. Uh, his run on daredevil over Marvel was like after years and years of like super dark film noir, gritty, uh, you know, like following Frank Miller's footsteps type stories, he made Daredevil a fun superhero comic again. And it was still dark. It still had uh, texture and grit, but it was also just more inventive and playful and fun. He worked with a lot of really exciting artists and they were all really trying to push the boundaries of what you could do with corporate comics. And uh, even though I thought he was doing a great job over at Marvel, Mark Wade to me is a DC guy through and through, you know? And I heard that he was back in the playhouse and like, he's actually kind of able to do some fun stuff again. So the main book of his that I've been reading that I'm crazy about and everyone should go out and get is Mark Wade's been doing this book called world's finest with the artist Dan Mora. Dan Mora is really cool. He's a very like kind of like kind of classical sort of style to him. That's kind of like kind of manga influence, but not heavily. So, and it world's finest, as you may know, is like a, has always been a title. That's like a Superman, Batman team up book. Uh, so the book is about Superman and Batman going on adventures together, but the book takes place in this sort of nebulously defined past. Like in these stories, Superman and Batman are like friends and they, they, they do stuff together. Robin is still Dick Grayson, but he's like a teenager. So he's like getting close to maybe turning into Nightwing. And then it's not just the, those two characters it's a, a bunch of other, uh, cameos and guest stars and stuff. And it, the book, I guess, technically takes place in continuity, but it, it it doesn't it doesn't say specifically where it takes place. It's sort of like its own little thing. And then some of the ideas that get presented in this sort of like throwback, almost like period piece version of DC, have been picked up in stuff Mark Wade is writing elsewhere in the DC universe in present day. So these things, I guess, technically are canon, but they're not like if you try to figure out exactly where it's like pointless, <laughs> like. It's like, oh, Dick Grayson is Robin again, but people all have smartphones. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's just very kind of weird. Like, is this a throwback? Is it not? But, like, the adventures are so fun that you don't care. And they've done 25 issues. I think the 25th issue came out uh, yesterday. Uh, but the first 25 issues are all so much fun. They're so fun. The art's really dynamic. The, 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 the dialogue is fun. The interplay, everything. It's, like, the most enjoyable to me superhero stories have been since, like, the justice league unlimited cartoon, maybe like it just has this, 
it feels like this is what DC's animation wing should be like. Do you know what I mean? Like these are very classical, very straightforward tales of these characters you love in these sort of perfectly distilled versions of them that are kind of not bogged down by a lot of the stuff that comes to the characters later. And I think they're just magical. Like I, I, I just got lost in them. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, comics aren't all for kids. Obviously a lot of comics are, are more mature and stuff and you can be an adult and enjoy comics. I don't mean to, to constantly say like, Oh, I feel like a baby because I'm reading comics, but reading these specific comics really made me feel the way I felt when I read like Grant Morrison's justice league of America book when I was in like fifth grade, you know what I mean? Like it was extremely healing for my inner child to just like tune out the world, tune out my job and everything else and just be at home just reading fun superhero. I mean, I, I guess I, like, I forgot that I do love superhero stories because for the last few years, I only consume them in movie form. And the vast majority of superhero movies to me are, are just not up to par. Uh, and reading Mark Wade, what he did with Superman and Batman, these characters together really reminded me what I love about superhero comics. And it made me feel like a kid again. And not in a way where I felt like it was infantilizing or too indulgent. Like, I feel like for a while there, Jeff Johns was doing a lot of stuff where he was taking characters back to what they were like when he was a kid. And it felt very fake and weird because it kind of felt like, Hey, you know, new readers should have stuff that's good for them too. It shouldn't just be making it back. Like when you were a kid, what about new kids? And even though Mark Wade is a similarly kind of traditional guy and like, you know, kind of wants to dial the, the clock back in some ways, he doesn't do it in a way where it feels regressive. He does it in a way where it feels, it still feels fun and real. And, um, I love world's finest and there's a spinoff of world's finest in the world's finest pocket of the universe, uh, with the teen Titans. It's really good too. It's like Dick trying to like corral the OG teen Titans lineup, not the, not the 1980s, not the lineup from like the cartoon that you see and stuff. And it's really good too. It's really, it's really, really good stuff, man. I'm so stoked that Mark is like back to doing stuff. The next big DC event, I think him and Dan Moore are doing together. It's called absolute power. And Amanda Waller's like the big villain and it looks really fun. I'm very excited for it because I feel like Mark is one of the handful of guys who does know how to write event comics in a way that doesn't suck. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited for that. Uh, but getting into that got me so hype again for superhero stories. I want to read more superhero shit like big B- Biff Boom Pow. I want, I want capes and, 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 and stuff. So, and, and I'd read a bunch of Batman. I was like, oh, there's some Superman stuff I want to catch up on, but the the last three uh, years or so of Superman comics are I don't want to say they're convoluted, but there's just a lot going on. Like for a little bit, Superman's son became the main Superman, and Superman went away, and then there's so many changes. They've done so much like weird continuity stuff that I was like, I don't know that I'm mentally in the mood for this. I don't want to be reading something and then have to pause and go check the other book that explains why this new thing happened. So I'm still going to read that stuff too. Like I have a whole list of stuff I want to get into, but I had to take a break and I was like, let me take a break and read something a little bit less less superhero y because I knew that whatever else I was going to read next was not going to be on the level of what Mark was doing. And then I remembered that, uh, I never finished. Okay. So Tom King, uh, around the time that I'd stopped reading comics for a while, Tom King had just come off of this extremely long run on Batman. He, when, when DC had had one of their many relaunch initiatives, rebirth in like 2016 ish, I want to say maybe, uh, Tom was the writer of the new, of like Batman, like Batman number one. And the book was on like a bi-weekly or every three week schedule. So more issues came out in a year than normal. And Tom was on his way to doing a hundred issue run in the character. Like the first time someone had done that, like in, in probably since like Grant Morrison, maybe when I was in high school. And I mean, someone can fact check me on that. I might be wrong, but it was at the time it was like really fun. Cause Tom had like a very unique take on the character to me anyway. And he worked with a variety of cool artists. And because the book had this weird uh, release schedule, it was like every arc was a different artist and people would do these like one-offs and, this, and stuff with different artists. And the one-offs were actually pretty in- engaging. And if you liked Batman, some issues would cater to the more gritty stuff. Some would cater to the more weird stuff. It was like all over the place. Uh, and then somewhere around like issue 50, building up to this big thing with Batman and Catwoman were supposed to get married. Uh, they didn't get married and there was like a big twist and people responded to it very viscerally. And then from there, the next several issues, it was very clear that Tom was like, did, he was like intending to stretch this out till he got to issue 100. Cause the issues were coming so fast that he could, he could kind of do that. 
but I feel like some readers were just like, they just started to tune out. I don't know. I don't know how it impacted sales really, but I just, I do know that they basically cut his plan to reach issue hundred short. He left around like 90 or 92. And then that's when uh, JT four came in, but then they announced, Hey, Tom King's leaving, but he's going to finish his Batman run in a new black label, like DC black label, like DC's like adult line or whatever, a new black label miniseries called Batwoman, Batman, Catwoman. It's going to wrap up the whole arc. And I remember reading the first issue when it came out and thinking, this is not, this does not feel like it's continuing what I just saw. This feels like it's some whole other weird shit. And then I fell off. So I read that finally (laughs) and I, I like it. It's, it's this like kind of, it's a story about Batman and Catwoman, you know, them, them kind of being in love, but it's also a story about the future where Catwoman kills the Joker but then it's also about the past involving the phantasm from mask of the phantasm. It's like one of the first times that this character been like in continuity and it kind of creates what feels like a weird, like love triangle between Bruce and Selena and the Joker. Um, I, I, there's, there's not a way I can really actually describe it. That's effective, but there's a lot of weird shit happening in that comic. Okay. Just a lot of, some of it is like, just feels edgy for edginess sake. Some of it feels, I think actually very touching. And some of it, it's, it's very, the thing about Tom King's comics to me, because I'm I'm mostly a fan is that I think the biggest issue people have with his stuff is that sometimes his ambition will read to people as pretension. It seems like he's just trying to make the book like artsy fartsy weird or something. Um, but the difficulty they have with it, it's not actually dissimilar to how people feel about Zack Snyder's justice league stuff, right? Is that, if you read some of Tom's DC work as being in continuity, as being part of the, the the larger whole, people get very bothered by some of his interpretations of the characters. Uh, but if you read it as a standalone thing he is doing with his interpretation of these characters, it's internally fine. Like if you don't give a shit about the larger interpretation of, of, of the characters doing a story where, you know, the Zack Snyder did, you know, like he planned to have like, Lois get knocked up with like Bruce's baby and all that stuff. It's like, it's like, that's yeah. That flies in the face of, of continuity and accepted stuff from the stories. But if it's internally consistent in its own story, it's not a big deal, but people, they really do get very, very uh, hung up on the details and like how things were in the, in the books. Tom King has several comics like Mr. Miracle, um, which sort of takes like Jack Kirby's fourth world characters and brings them into this sort of like indie drama character study about like depression and stuff. He's got uh, Heroes in Crisis, which is is somewhat similar, but it it has a bunch of Justice League characters dealing with grief and trauma. He's got Strange Adventures, which is an Adam Strange comic, but it's also takes Adam Strange in some very different directions than what that character is used to doing. And each of these books, if you read them and you and you think about, well, they just did that to Adam Strange. Adam Strange is always going to have this as being a part of his character. And it's like if that's the main objection you have to it, if you take that out, the stories themselves are are like cool for the most part. Um. Like I actually really enjoyed strange adventures. And then the only parts of it that were nagging me was me thinking, is this just the new status quo? And then when I stopped fucking worrying about that, I didn't care. And that's one of the, one of the things that makes comics better to me as an adult is that I never stop thinking about the artifice of the shared universe. And that it's sort of like continuity is not everything. Continuity is not like, the 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 consistency or whatever of these characters in this world and they're all being written by a bunch of different people (laughs) drawn by a bunch of different artists i don't care as much about if one writer sees batman one way and someone else does another as long as they're not drastically different from the underlying core of the character i'm okay with being there being different takes you know and like essentially they're different characters like you know what i mean like they're they're literally different characters and if you try really hard to force them all to be the same thing uh, if you're Grant Morrison, you can tell a seven, eight year long Batman story that believably creates a, a tale where this is one man's life over the course of a hundred years of a publication history. Like you can do that and it's exciting and, and kind of meta and stuff, but also it's okay to just be like when so-and-so was writing Batman, this was Batman. And then he left and a new person came on and that's a different Batman. It's a different thing. It's its own thing. And it only becomes really irritating if you have to try to read all of the books because then you're reading one Batman book where Batman's one way, then you're reading another book where he's a little bit different and you find it to be inconsistent. They're just different books. They're just reading different things, you know? And it's, um, that to me 
I, I, I like that Tom King seems to enjoy doing this thing of these 12 issue maxi series with sort of an off kilter artist compared to like the sort of the more DC house style. And they're doing like the kind of vertigo comics, uh, kind of like art house, almost like eight, the a 24 approach to some of these characters or something. You know what I mean? And it's cool. And like, if you just look at it as for what it is, it can be really enjoyable. But if you look at it and you're like, well, what the fuck? Like, uh, he did a book with, uh, Crick Smallwood, I think, uh, um, the human target. And it's probably one of the better human target books. I really, I'm really pretty preferable to Peter Milligan's work on the character, but it's a, it's like a pretty, 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 pretty good book. I actually really dug it, but there's like a, for example, there's like a scene in it where like Martian Manhunter is having sex with fire from justice league international. And I remember some people were like bothered by that as if this is a book and that's in continuity. And I'm like, I don't think this book is really in con. You know what I mean? I don't think other writers are going to be like referencing it because it's so idiosyncratic. It's so unique to its own thing. All of Tom King's takes on these characters feel like, um, isolated from the rest of the universe. And I think that's fine. I'm, I, th- I think you should be able to tell those kinds of stories without having to be like, this is an else world. This is an alternate reality. This is a, you know what I mean? Like I'm not as interested anymore in like, Oh, this is Superman. But what if he was a vampire? What if he was evil? I'm much more interested in this is my Superman. This is where I'm going with it. I don't have to fucking worry about the other implications. I don't have to worry about how this is going to affect the animated series or the video game or the movie or the other seven Superman books, you know? So that was kind of a big eye opener for me realizing like, Oh yeah, at this, at my big age, I don't give a shit about a lot of that stuff anymore. A lot of the things that would make people not like some of these books, um, like just don't bother me. I don't care. I'm not, I'm not beholden anymore to, to that i don't have to worry about you know whether or not uh editorial is going to be happy with all this stuff lines up i can just ignore the other stuff i don't have to read all of it and um yeah but that but that also wrestling with that realization and i ended up reading like i don't know six of his series back to back i ended up after it's only been one week already a little burnt out on superhero comics already uh, and kind of being like, I got to take a break. I love superhero stuff. I'm going to read plenty more in the coming weeks. But for right now, I might take a little bit of a break. And that break brought me to uh, one of my favorite comic book writers, Ed Brubaker, who uh, I guess the most mainstream thing he's he's probably known for is that he created the Winter Soldier. He did not create Bucky, but he came up with the story where Bucky comes back and he's the Winter Soldier and stuff. That's all him. His run on Captain America and was that like, oh, f- six or something? Oh, five, oh, six. I don't remember. Um, that's where all that shit comes from. Uh, and when I was this whole journey about reading all these Ed Brubaker comics is that in my mind, I always considered in my head, I, I thought Ed was like a peer. If that makes sense. Like I thought of us as not being like the same age, but in my mind I was always like, he's not that much. He's not one of the older guys. He's like one of the younger guys. Uh, and then I had to go back and realize that like Ed Brubaker was writing Batman when I was in middle school, he was writing Batman for the first time pre nine 11. Uh, Edward Baker's 57 years old. He's 20 years older than me. Um, and I've been reading his book since I was a kid, but I don't think of him on the same plane as like Mark Wade, Grant Morrison, Peter David, Chris Claremont, you know, like the people that were like already veterans when I was a kid, like because he was a newcomer when I was a kid, he felt like kind of a newcomer for a while. Like even by the time he got to do Captain America, it was it, to me, it was kind of crazy that the guy that started out doing, like low life and scene of the crime and stuff like that was, was now writing captain America, you know, but in reality, by that point, he'd been doing this shit for years. Um, so over the years, he's done a lot of really great stuff, primarily in like the espionage crime fiction space, right? He hasn't done corporate Cape comics since he left X-Men in like 2000 and him and him and Matt fracture were writing uncanny X-Men. And then he left and fraction took over. I think that's the last major, thing brew wrote uh at marvel or he might have or might have been finishing cap i don't remember um but he was one of the many guys from that era the early 2010s and stuff who like largely went over to image and started doing creator own stuff and he's been doing what i started doing was i reread or i read uh him and sean phillips uh when i was in high school ish i guess i was high school late middle school him and Sean Phillips did this comic called Sleeper at DC uh, for Wildstorm, like this part of DC that they owned. And Sleeper is two seasons. It's two 12-issue series, and it's a great comic. It holds up super well. It's a really, really fun comic. And 
those two have been like an inseparable pair ever since. They've done a ton of comics together and they're all so good. Most recently, uh, right before my comics hiatus, they put out a book called Reckless. It was a standalone graphic novel starring this character, Ethan Reckless, and it was sort of like Brubaker and Phillips' take on like a Rockford Files style PI, you know, like Travis McGee type character. And they wanted to do an ongoing series of original graphic novels about this character, the same way like if you were like writing the Fletch novels or, or something like that. And the first one came out at like the maybe like early 2021 maybe and i loved it and I, I saw they did four more since then and in a couple of years they already did four of them so i read all of those back to back and they were fucking great they're so good they're such a fun throwback these like 70s and 80s set crime stories like they feel very uh you know like throwback to like old television but also like crime movies and 70s movies. it's really really fun shit and then I, while I was reading about that, I was wondering, has anyone bought the rights to Reckless? Because this could be a cool series of movies or something or show. And then I saw that Amazon had got the rights to Criminal, which is probably, I think, him and Phillips, like maybe best, most well-known work. Uh, and that made me reread the last series of Criminal that they did in 2020. And then that made me reread the entire fucking series. And again, this is a comic that I like, and I always have a recency bias towards, and I forgot that the first arc of it came out in like 2006 or 2007. I started reading Criminal like right out of high school. So this this book's been around for a while. And if you've ever read Criminal, the best way I can describe it is Criminal is like... The way Sin City all takes place in one city, and there's overlap between all these standalone stories, but Sin City is like really stylized and really over the top and not remotely realistic... Criminal is like real Sin City. Like it's all one city, all these characters and all these standalone crime fiction stories interact and, and, and intercut and stuff. But it's like way more down to earth and way more gritty and stuff and grounded. And they're really good. And I cannot recommend them enough. Like cannot, like stop what you're doing. <laughs> Turn the podcast off and get, you can pick up any random criminal trade uh, coward, lawless, like any of them. They've all been reprinted multiple times, whatever, any iteration of them, just pick one up and you'll fall in love. And then you can just start from scratch or start, start the whole thing over. They're all really, really good. And I rereading them just made me feel so good. Uh, cause I love crime fiction. I love mysteries. I love, I love heists. I love detectives. And my favorite thing about criminal is when the book was first coming out, every single issue would have a letters page, but they also have a section where like brew would just talk about movies he had watched recently or crime books he had read recently. And there's always a lot of really good recommendations. And then they would also, he would get friends to write essays about things. So like, there's a lot of really movies I really, really love that I discovered through criminal. Like I never, like Charlie Varick with Walter Matthau, I watched because uh, I want to say Matt Fraction wrote a, 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 an essay about it in the back of an issue of criminal. Patton Oswalt wrote an issue about blast of silence. Um, you know, like there's all these movies that I checked out just because Brew Baker and his friends, all these like, you know, crime nerds basically like would talk about them. And that book alongside like Casanova, Fractions, like Super Spy Book, like those things both uh, introduced me to a lot of media that are really important to me to this day. So that was really fun, man. It was, I, like it was nice catching up with Superman and Batman and catching up with those characters, but it was extra nice catching up and realizing that Brew Baker and Phillips have put out like so many books in the last three years, they put out five reckless books. They put out a book called uh, night fever, which is sort of like a, like a horror crime comic. And then they put out a book called uh, where the body was found, which is really fucking good. And even though Sean Phillips art style always looks kind of similar and the brew was always kind of telling stories in a similar way. They find so many ways to vary, like for to do variations of what they do. Like you would think two guys who are always telling crime comics over the course of like 20 years would like run out of stuff, but they always find new ways to make it exciting again or new ways to look at it or new ways to, to, to try to do stuff. And they, they refine their storytelling, they refine their approach and reading them all, like so many of them back to back to back to back and rereading old stuff that I already had. It was like so much fun. Um, it really made me feel like really good and like alive. I was just like, man, I love this shit. Like. I really urge anyone who's never read, if you've, if you read any, uh, like if you like anything from Edward Rakers, but you haven't read his reckless books, get the reckless books, um, get night fever, get where the body was found. Uh, it's all really good stuff. 
sorry, it was really, really, really good stuff. It was just really nice to, part of me was, even as I was rereading stuff that I enjoyed that was at DC, I did start to feel this sort of like cynicism creeping in of, there's not as many creators at DC or Marvel that I'm really, like, I okay, I love characters, right? Like, I love Batman, I love Superman, I love the Fantastic Four, I love the X-Men or whatever. But as I got older, like, there's so many stories about all these characters that what usually gets me into new stories about them are creators whose work I like being asked to be stewards of these of these characters, you know? So I like Spider-Man, right? I'm not going to read any Spider-Man comic because there's a lot of shitty ones. I love Batman. Uh, there are some bad Batman comics, you know? So, like, usually what happens is there's a writer or an artist you really like and they get put on that book and you're like, yeah, I got to see what's going on over there. Like, there's been plenty of Superman, Batman team up books over the last several years. I wouldn't have read a new one if I didn't know Mark Wade was writing it. You know, uh, I would not be interested in certain things. I'll give you a perfect example because this is going to dovetail in it. I'm going to talk about the X-Men cartoon. I haven't reread any, I haven't got any Marvel stuff this whole time. Um, I think I'm going to like exhaust the fuck out of my DC and infinite uh, subscription and then give Marvel unlimited a try and catch up on all the Marvel stuff I'm behind on. Uh, but the X-Men are characters that have been through a lot of different eras, a lot of different stuff. Like they've been very popular for like 30, 40, 50 years. Wait, no, 60 years. The first X-Men comics came out in the early sixties, like six years, these characters. And it wasn't until like 2019 ish that like Jonathan Hickman coming back to Marvel and taking over the X line where it felt like someone was putting real effort into making the books good again, like exciting and different and new and alive and vital and the X-Men had not felt like they mattered to me the way they did when Powers of Ten and House of X came out. I hadn't felt that alive with the X-Men since high school and Grant Morrison put out new X-Men uh, 114 with Frank Whiteley. Um, that was like a game changer in my life. And Hickman was doing so much fun stuff and some of the creators they brought on the line. It was really exciting. And he left prematurely. And the other people that can't kind of took over are like wrapping up that era of X-Men comics, the Kirk Cohen era that has been very popular for the last like few years. And the X-Men announced or not the X-Men, but Marvel announced like, Hey, here's who's here's the new era of the X-Men comics. And it's Gail Simone writing a book called uncanny, uncanny X-Men in a book called it's, it's like the flagship X-Men book. And then uh, Jed McKay, who currently is writing Avengers for them, is also now writing uh, X-Men, the adjectiveless X-Men book. And then Eve Ewing is coming in to do Exceptional X-Men. Those are the three flagship now X-Men books. I don't know what else. They're, they're probably going to launch like 10 more. It's, it's Marvel. But they look so boring. <laughs> they look so unimaginative and basic. And people's costumes look like you're throwing back to like the 90s and shit. And it's like, oh, yeah, see, everything's back to normal. All the people who thought that the Kirk Cohen stuff was too weird and too highfalutin, it's over. And if you thought it was too woke, we're going to try to to not piss off you, but we're also still not going to stop. You know, we don't want to make piss off the woke people either. It's this very like weird middle of the road, whatever. And it's because they made Tom Brevoort, uh, the editor of the X line again. And like this guy just, I think just prefers to keep things as simple as possible. And there's no fervor for the, sh- for the stuff. Like he, he posted the thing about like a, a thing about the the promotional art. It was like a trailer for the new X comics. And he was like, I'm not seeing a lot of, a lot of uh, excitement for this online. So I'm going to post the trailer again. And then the replies were showing how cursed and bad the comic book industry is. There were a bunch of people who were mad that this is not the Krakoan stuff, which is fair. There were a bunch of people who were mad that it still keeps anything from that era of the stuff. Like we wanted that wipe, wiped away from the, the sleet. And there's people who are just like mad about the X-Men cartoon, completely fucking unrelated to the X-Men comics at this point, being like, nah, see, it's still that woke shit. We don't want anything to do with that. And you guys made fun of us and said we were we were, we were racist. And oh, my God, it was so cursed. Um, I saw some person being like, I'm not going to support anything from at Disney or at Marvel until they hashtag die fest from these DEI programs and this forced diversity. And I was just like, holy shit, man, I cannot fucking I can't with you people. Uh and it reminded me that I was enjoying comics because I was not engaging with anything outside of reading them. <laughs> you know, like I didn't go ch- check to see what people thought about Mark Wade's world finest. I didn't give a shit. I wasn't going on Reddit. I wasn't going on Twitter. Nothing. I was having a ball. The second I accidentally see a fucking tweet about this, these new X-Men comics, all hell was breaking loose in front of my eyes. And I was like, Oh, gross. But it did make me want to at least check out the Disney card the Disney plus cartoon X-Men 97. So when I was a kid, I love the X-Men. I love the nineties cartoon as most people did. 
And I didn't fully grasp until I watched it that this is supposed to directly be a, a, a real uh, uh, sequel to the animated series from the 90s. Like, they got most of the voice cast back. The designs are very similar. Um, when I saw the trailer, I was like, I think this looks like shit. <laughs> I thought the animation looked kind of ugly and I thought it looked like, I don't want to say cheap, but it felt like it felt unbecoming of a giant animation thing from Disney. I just felt like, I'm like, really? Did they put any, I don't want to, I don't want to say, did they put any work into this? Cause obviously a lot of work goes into animating a show. I don't mean to, to, uh, uh, downplay that obviously, but it just does not look like it has like the fullness It doesn't feel the kind of robust. Like there's so many amazing things happening in animation elsewhere in the world. And every time there's a new animated thing that's like for superhero stuff, it always looks kind of like whatever. And then having watched it, I feel like it's actually not that dissimilar to like the Invincible show, where I thought the animation of Invincible looked flat and kind of boring and cheap. And then the action scenes are pretty good, but then the rest of it just looks like whatever. That's the feeling I got. I'm like, this looks one step above like Frisky Dingo or something. Do you know what I mean? And I will say that I ended up actually enjoying the two episodes that I watched. Uh, I don't think it's great. But for what they're going for, I get it. And I think that the writing is solid. I feel kind of bad that that Bo DeMaio guy got fired for having an OnlyFans or something. I don't know if, these, if he did some other shit that has, that has come to light that I haven't read yet, then I apologize. But if they fired him just because he was showing Hog on Maine, um, I don't... <laughs> like Chris Claremont never whipped it out before or something. I don't know. It just seems it seems weird to, to like if he got fired for just being a part-time sex worker. Um... But it's actually not bad. I mean, like, I'm not going to lie. The X-Men 97 cartoon seems a lot more interesting than whatever the fuck Tom Brevoort has planned for the actual X-Men comics. Um, I feel like the characterizations are pretty, pretty on point, even though they're still a little bit stifled by having to be the 90s cartoon characterizations. Because, like, Beast, Gambit, and Rogue don't get very much to do in the first two episodes, and they feel extremely flanderized. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, Gambit just has that sort of like, I'm making bayonets. Um, and rogue just sounds like no Southern person has ever sounded ever. It just says ridiculous things. And you're like, that's not how anybody talks. You know what I mean? And the beast just like very all my stars and garters, but I thought it was fun. Actually. Like the fight scenes are pretty good. I think people are like a little bit over hyping that Cyclops fight. It's, it's, it's like, it's kind of how I felt about the fight from the end of invincible when Omni man kills everybody. I, th- it's, I feel people are reacting like that, but I don't think it's actually as good. Um, but hey, this is the first thing I've seen in a while where like Cyclops is like the, the right kind of Cyclops. Um, and it does feel like it's being true to what people liked about the 90s cartoon while still being informed by more nuanced characterizations that have come more recently in comics and stuff. Like this Cyclops feels like he benefits from the growth the character showed from like 2004 ish to like now or whatever, you know? So that's pretty exciting. And they've already set up in those first two uh, issues alone, a couple of like, you know, fun stories and stuff. Like, uh, the first episode I thought was fine, but then the second episode uh, brings in cunty Magneto. Um, like the, you know, it's kind of doing their version of the story when Magneto took over the school briefly and he has the like, cape and the giant M costume that I believe John Romita Jr. designed for this that storyline was going on around Uncanny 200 I want to say uh, I love that design it's fucking absurd it doesn't make any sense the idea that like um, in this cartoon the, the bigger thing is that this is picking up from when the series ended but now Xavier's dead that's the big the big the big uh, jumping on point so the idea is that the last time we saw Magneto he had the red and purple suit and the helmet and all that stuff and now his ex best friend slash nemesis slash ex lover is dead, and he's just got letting his hair out, no helmet. He just he looks so just like cunty, and uh, there's just so many moments in his ep- this episode where he's just being like a stunt queen, and it's like just so many. Th- I mean, Magneto's always like there's always a, a, a scene in the books where Magneto has to like pontificate and give a big speech while a bunch of spinning shit is going on behind him that he's doing some his magnetic powers. There's a, spark, there's a big, there's a big thing in the in the second episode where he's delivering this big impassioned speech, and he's got a guy magneted stuck to a giant like what looks like a giant penny. It's not, but it looks like one, and it's just spinning around behind him. And I'm just like, why is it spinning? Like, just I mean, I I know it's to make the scene look dynamic, but I was like, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, I think it's, but I think it's actually a fun show, man. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna hate. Uh, I wish it didn't look like that. 
that is my biggest criticism is I wish it did not look like that. I wish it looked good. Like, I, I don't understand why people are not, I mean, like I don't watch a lot of anime or any, quite frankly, but like there's a lot of exciting looking things happening in the world of anime. And it would be really cool if people spent the money and the time and the effort or whatever it's supposed to take to make stuff look that exciting here. You know, um, like I'm not asking for this to look like fucking spider verse or something. I'm just saying like, don't look like this, please. It just, I don't like it. Uh, but I don't dislike it enough to not watch. I'll probably keep checking it out. I do kind of wish if they were going to be dropping one episode or two episodes a week that they were dropping them Saturday mornings. I saw someone suggest that online. I thought that would have been cute. They're not doing that though. I might just not watch them until Saturday mornings myself. There's no, no sense of urgency there. Um, but yeah, to me, I think part of what's making this a little bit easier is like, if I want to get back into X-Men right now and I want to read new X-Men stuff, I'll have to read Gail Simone's Uncanny X-Men, which I cannot, I cannot imagine being anything above mid. And then I'm going to have to read it with them addressing stuff from the previous complicated era that's ending, but then promising a brand new tomorrow that's different and having to watch them do that dance of, of being beholden to continuity, but being open to new stuff, blah, 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 blah. Very few writers are good at it anymore and it just it just i don't care so in a way it's it's nicer to just be able to watch this cartoon you know what i mean like it's it's x-men stories it's, it's x-men stories i already know to a degree but i would almost rather a nostalgic like a blatantly nostalgic play of replaying the hits but you're actually adapting old hits versus hey it's brand new it looks just like the old shit, but uglier, but it's brand new. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want anything to do with that. And I think it's um, embarrassing that that's what they're doing after some of the most innovative and like boundary pushing X-Men comics like ever to so just go, Hey, here it is. It's milk toast, middle of the road. No one's going to get mad. Please don't be mad. Please don't think we're woke. Please don't think we're anti-woke. Just please just buy. Um, and it's obviously going to have to reboot again whenever they decide, decide on what they're going to do with the MCU side of the X-Men. But for now, it just feels like completely unnecessary. At the moment, if I wanted new content about the X-Men to enjoy, I'm uh, the 97 cartoon is kind of all there is. Uh, but it's not, like I said, it's actually not bad. It, it pleasantly surprised me. So if you were on the fence about watching it, um, give it a shot. It's a, like an hour of your time. And if you don't like it, don't watch the rest. You know, but um, I thought it was cool. I'm glad I actually am not regretting that I watched it. So yeah, okay, we got time for a couple of questions. Um, uh, Question number one as it's loading very slowly up. Oh. Uh, okay. Question number one, Tony asks, are there smaller movies that you'd prefer to watch the movie screen rather than at home? Or is it only big budget action and sci-fi movies that really draw you in? Okay. This is a good question. So I like watching movies on the big screen in general, like what, whatever kind of movie comedy, romance, thriller, whatever. Movies in the big screen are, I feel like, preferable. I watch a lot of movies at home. I watch a lot of movies on my MacBook. I don't even fucking hook it up to the TV or anything. I have no problem watching movies like in bed on my computer. Um, but there are sometimes I would prefer to watch something in a theater, and it isn't always just spectacle. Like, I'll give you an example. Uh, I watched Skinamarink last year, and that was a movie where I kept thinking, this is cool i get i get what they're going for and i might have been beguiled by it in a theater but like there are certain things that if i watch them at home i i cannot pro trust myself to give it the full attention sometimes you do need the movie theater to you know like uh envelop you <laughs> and force you to turn your phone off and, ju and just be subject to the movie you know and it doesn't have to be a dude it doesn't have to be a big thing for me to want to do that. Sometimes there are very intimate stories or small dramas that I'll watch at home and I'll be like, I would have liked this more if this is in, in, in a real theater. Like it makes me think about, this is usually the example I use is like, uh, Noah Baumbach made the movie Greenberg. It's what, like his fourth, fourth feet, fifth feature. Um, with Ben Stiller. It's the one where he fucking met Greta Gerwig and decided to uh, cheat on the woman who was he co-wrote the movie with uh, he had a baby with and um Greenberg is shot by Harris Savitas I believe one of the last movies he shot before he passed and it's shot in this like beautiful wide like cinema scope kind of aspect ratio and when it came out people were like why did you shoot a movie like this in scope like why is it such a wide frame but if you watch Greenberg it's a, such a kind of like prickly uh uncomfortable story and seeing it unfold in like a big in like a big wide frame and stuff i mean obviously you could have shot it like 
like sort of like flatter or more like a like a more kind of square cramped aspect ratio and could have created like some claustrophobia or something but I like the way Greenberg looks I, and it looks I, I saw it on on, on, a, on a big screen I saw it in, in, a, in a big theater and I think it was a better experience than when I rewatched it later at home like I thought that that was the right way to see that movie even though it's just a movie about like an asshole and the people he meets you know it didn't have any there were no robots there were no spaceships there were no explosions so uh for me i think in general i prefer to see things on the big screen any experience because the people's faces are bigger the sound is louder everything is just more intense you know i think people forget that it's like yeah seeing a big spectacle on a big screen is cool but seeing the human face real big is great too i think that's part of why oppenheimer works so well a lot of that movie is an imax frame of killian murphy's face just making little little face stuff you know and that can be really compelling. It can be really, uh, it can really draw you in. So, yeah, it doesn't have to just be fucking Star Wars. I think that the big screen is is good for all things. And then last question. Um, so this is a sort of a long question, but there's also like a preamble to it. I'm going to read the whole thing just so the conversation makes more sense. Uh, my man JM asks, "Hey Dom, thank you. I listened to your podcast about the Dune Two discourse, and I was fist pumping in agreement with everything you said." The Glazers are tumbling over themselves to characterize Dune 2 as some sort of dark tragedy when, like you said, if we look objectively at the events which take place in the movie, Paul hasn't done anything that we could re- we can consider an escalation in darkness or tragedy. The Pauls of villain declarations are super overblown. This leads into a question I have for the pod. Am I out of touch, or has there been a metatextual collapse in the way we watch movies? Are people becoming increasingly incapable of engaging with movies as singular texts as opposed to parcels of content in extended metatexts? To use Dune 2 example, the Dune 2 example, it seems like all those Paul is a villain zealots don't even realize that they came to that conclusion from metatextual evidence instead of textual evidence. They don't see a distinction between something that happens in the movie versus something that happens in the sequel to the book that the movie is adapting, and they end up blending it all together as one text. You can also look at the way we can't watch MCU movies as movies anymore, and we increasingly have to go into each new entry with the knowledge of TV shows, comic book lore, casting information, inter-studio licensing deals, etc. to get any sense of what's going on in the movies. So, the answer to that question is, no, JM, you are not out of touch. You're fine. Yes, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. And then the other question is, are people becoming increasingly incapable of engaging? The thing is, I don't think that it's people, I don't think that it's people are incapable I think that it's that so many things are now, they have to be more than what they are. Very few movies of a certain size and scale of a certain level of marketing can just be the movie. It's usually based on something. It's usually promising something new in the future. There's usually going to be a show or a something and it's all connected. Um, I remember when this first started happening with the MCU stuff where people would like criticize like faults in the movie and then someone would go, well, in the comics, this happens, and we know that's going to happen later. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I read those comics too, sure. But in this movie, that didn't happen. That, like, you know, it's like nothing exists in a vacuum. So I think it's cool when something is like, I like when something plays fine to people that don't know the other stuff, but then it plays on a different level to the people that do. I like when something has layered, is a layered experience. I like when. If you're a newbie, you can have one experience. If you're uh, an intermediary, you can have a different experience. If you're like diehard, you have, you know what I mean? Like, I like the idea that it, it'll play to everybody. That's kind of the way I think you should do it. I think it's worse when it expects you to do that. It, it, it does not. I think it's unfair when someone who is viewing it on one plane like I'm reading, I'm viewing this on the plane of I know this, I know the book, I know the source material, I know the the examinations, all the theories, and I'm arguing with someone who doesn't has no idea what any of that stuff is, and they've only seen the movie, and I'm arguing at them with the stuff that I have, and it's like we technically watched two different movies, right? Like you watched a movie and you came into it with all the all this context and all these all these uh, all this kind of baggage in a way. And then you watch, I, you know, I'm watching it. I'm just seeing this for the first time. I'm just taking it for, for what it is. And I think it's difficult to acknowledge that that does seem to be like the, the, it, that seems to be the prevalent thing now, you know, uh, so many things have to have built in like winks and nods to other stuff. You know, if I decide, like if I made, I'm trying to think of a good example. Well, you know, Hey, let's look at it this way. 20 years from now, let's say I'm making a Wonder Woman movie. 
and Gal Gadot is alive and I don't get her for a cameo, that'll be a demerit against for some people. Even I mean, even though people not everybody liked her as Wonder Woman or whatever, it'll be like, oh, why is there a cameo for the original person? Like, why isn't there something to remind us, to reward us for being aware of the past? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, why isn't there a little thing for why can't I get a little treat? Hey, I know Lou Ferrigno used to be the Hulk. Where's my little treat? Hey, I know who Stan Lee is. Where's my little treat? Uh, and I, like, you're right. That is like the norm now. That's like just that's that's the regular. That's like how you're expected to make these things. And it's kind of stifling, I think. Um, you know, uh, and I mean, there's different approaches to it. Like, okay, Godzilla Kong's coming out next week, right? Or the, yeah, I think it's next week. And like there's probably going to be shit in that. And I think there was in the last movie that is like, if you are a diehard Godzilla person, you'll notice little Easter eggs and stuff like that. But if you're not, who cares? It's just Godzilla and Kong fucking shit up, you know? So in some cases, I think it doesn't matter if it's like cute, uh, winks and nods and references for the people who are into that shit, but then a regular functioning movie for anyone who's not, I don't like when the two things collide and it becomes like, no, that's part of it. You have to know this stuff. You need to go do your research. And if you don't, then, you know, you're not getting it. And I think I hate it too, because it kind of incentivizes people to be like, to lord it over each other. I feel like the MCU specifically really started this trend of, you know, the movie's ending and someone's like, no, don't, don't get up. Like there's gonna be a post credit scene. The post credit scene happens. You have to listen to someone explain to his girlfriend, like, okay, that's Thanos. And there's this whole thing. And da, da, da. And like, I remember distinctly like, when the first Thanos uh, post credits happened, hearing a guy explaining Thanos to his girlfriend and then, hey, that's not actually what Thanos was like when he finally showed up. You know what I mean? It's like, well, you need to know that he has this thing for death. They didn't do, they didn't use any of that shit. They went a whole different direction, you know? So having people do the thing of like, who is this? Let me go read the screen rant explainer. Who is Star Fox at the end of Eternals? Why is Harry, Harry Styles being this guy? What does this mean? What, what, what stories might they, you know? Um, and like, and the thing is, in some cases, I feel like that's kind of necessary. Okay. For instance, I was watching X-Men 97, right? And there's a moment in, in the show about X-Men and uh, X-Men about Magneto and rogue. And I couldn't remember like the origin of that in the comics lore. And I went to go Google it, hoping there would be like a Reddit post or something about it. And there was an article from screen or somebody being like, why did that happen? And then they, you know, like that's a cottage industry. That's like a job. It is now there is someone, there is a job in society that is to preemptively explain where something in the show came from in the source material rather than you have to go read all the source material yourself, you know? And that's not a thing about gatekeeping or posers or whatever, but it's like, if you grew up reading comics and reading all this shit and knowing all this stuff about the lore, and then there's just someone explaining it to someone else and that person read an explainer and then now they're lording the knowledge they got from the explainer over someone that doesn't have it, that really bothers me. I know it sounds crazy, but it's like, look, I was fucking reading X-Men comics when fucking Joseph was happening. When, when fucking Magneto was, was revealed to have been pretending to be Eric the Red for a year or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I've been through the trenches with these fucking characters. So, but, it, 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 you know, I've been reading X-Men comics since I was four years old. But I forgot this core thing about Rogue and Magneto. I can remember when it came from. And I just wanted to go look it up. And I guarantee there was going to be someone arguing with someone on Twitter who learned it from that Screen Rant article against someone who never read it and they're going to act like they're one of the people that read it. Like you didn't read this stuff. You just got it from this thing, from this omnipresent, uh, like these rings around the planet that is, is, is IP, you know? And I hate it. I don't know. It really bothers me. And it just shouldn't bother me because who cares, but it does bother me a little bit. It's not even like a, Oh, well I liked the nerd stuff when it was not cool. It's not that it's more like there is a difference between like, having read a thing versus reading a thing about a thing. And when I talk to people about things that I read about a thing, I talk differently than when I read the thing, you know, I don't, I put, there's less bass in my voice when I know I'm operating off of like third hand information. And some people don't have that. Some people skim a Wikipedia article and be like, I'm a genius and you're a fucking idiot, you know? And I don't like that. I think it's nasty. I hope that answers the question, but yeah, I know I agree with you. It's a, it's a, it's a startling thing. And, Maybe it'll go away. Maybe it'll get worse. (laughs) Maybe everything is going to require more and more context and layers to, to function. Um, uh, or maybe earth just won't even be here anymore. Who knows? There's there's a lot of ways this could go. Thanks though. Jay. that's really cool. Really good. Really good. Uh, question. Uh, that's the episode gang. Uh, thank you all for, for rocking with me this week. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please hit, uh, 
the thumbs up if you liked it. Like if you liked it, like it. If you loved it, subscribe. If you really want to know what's going on with me, hit the little bell icon and get notifications whenever I put out new content. And if you have any questions, if you want to talk about anything, you put them in the comments below. I'll, I'll talk to you. I'll answer them. If you have questions for future episodes, you can put those in the comments as well. You can send them to me on Twitter, uh, on Instagram, uh, everywhere. I have an email address for this specific thing too. It's armchairautor at gmail.com. You can send questions there. Uh, and if you listen to this on any podcast platform of your choosing, thank you for rocking with the audio version of the show. And I hope you guys like listening to it. Uh, I don't know on your commute or on the treadmill, wh wherever you're listening to it. I don't, I don't know. I don't care, but I, I really appreciate anyone who's been listening to this. It's uh, it's really fun to have uh, this little community we've been building. And I really I appreciate it a lot. So uh, thank you guys again, as always, we'll, we'll talk soon.